This video is sponsored by ClickUp, the one productivity app to replace them all. Hey, happy Friday. This week, Chinese phone brands got into trouble, except for now it's all over the world. OnePlus and Nokia kept killing all the things that we actually liked about them. And it's also earnings week this week, except things are looking a little bit rough. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. Okay, my release highlights this week start with the Asus Zenfone 9, an excellent seeming compact phone. It has a 5.9 inch 120Hz OLED screen, although sadly not fully LTPO, and beside that almost all the flagship specs that you could want. A Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 processor, 8 to 16 gigs of RAM, stereo speakers, and the new Sony IMX766 sensor that's 40% bigger than its predecessor and also comes with 6-axis gimbal stabilization. There's also IP P68 water resistance, a headphone jack, and even a battery that is reasonably sized at 4,300 milliamp hours with a 30 watt charger in the box as well. The chin on the screen looks fairly big, and Asus has a pretty weak history with software updates, but otherwise, this seems like a great compact ish phone on paper, especially for 799 euros. Nice. Then Red Magic launched the 7S Pro gaming phone internationally, which they hilariously called the 7 Pro in their own promo videos mistakenly, and it has 10 layers of cooling, an RGB fan, a shoulder, trigger, buttons, all the high-end gaming specs, and interestingly, a dedicated second processor called the Red Core 1, which handles audio, RGB lighting, and haptic feedback. Then Anchor this week has also released a new lineup of chargers that it is calling Gan Prime, part of its second generation gallium nitride based semiconductor devices that are now even smaller and even more powerful. There's a big variety of form factors and even a power strip and they should start shipping in late Q3. Next, Samsung celebrated the first real shipments of its 3 nanometer gate all around process. Korean media suggested that its first customer is a Chinese crypto mining company and like we mentioned a few weeks ago, the new process is supposed to use 45% less power, be 23% faster and 16% smaller than its predecessor, though this is still a trial production, not full mass manufacturing yet. And finally this week, Lenovo also started shipping their first Qualcomm Snapdragon 8CX Gen 3 laptop, the 13-inch ThinkPad X13S, which has a quoted battery life of up to 28 hours, 5G support and more. The performance jump over the last generation sounds very impressive, though that's kind of a low bar, and the machine will start from about $1,300. Okay, and for my first story of the week, we have Chinese phone brands getting in trouble in China, Europe, and India. Pretty tough. Let's start with the first two. So first, the Chinese smartphone market is down yet another 14% year over year versus an already disastrous quarter, which now puts Chinese phone sales back to the levels of 2012, according to Counterpoint. That's a decade ago when the iPhone 5 was brand new. Chinese phone sales now sit about 60 million units a quarter, which is less than half of where they were at their peak. And of course, the brands that are suffering the most are the domestic ones, with the exception of Honor, which seems to be gobbling up much of the market share that Huawei has lost. Other than Honor though, only Apple managed to hold on to their market share but had falling shipments in the country as well, and everyone else had massive declines. Chinese phone sales have been shrinking for a while now as the market has become saturated, but the current drop is likely made even worse through lockdowns, production crunches, etc. The story in Europe is somewhat similar, with Oppo slash OnePlus as well as Xiaomi taking big losses in a shrinking market, primarily due to supply chain issues and relatively weak portfolio portfolios, allowing Apple and Samsung to do much better. And meanwhile, Chinese brands also kept having regulatory issues in India. Honor's team has just up and left the country completely, apparently, and Vivo in India has now been accused of challenging the integrity and sovereignty of India. Damn. I'm not going to be covering every single detail of these stories, but this India situation is getting pretty damn insane. So this week, Honor's chief executive, Zhao Ming, said that the company was pulling its team out of India for, quote, obvious reasons, aka all the investigations that the other Chinese brands have been under. Now, Honor isn't straight up quitting India after only forming there a few years ago, but it is pulling out its own official team. Zhao reportedly said that the Shenzhen-based company's Indian business will remain in operation 
region managed by local partners, but the brand will adopt a quote, very safe approach. Then later, the official Honor PR channels issued a statement explaining that what Zhao said was actually not correct. Instead, Honor is quote, maintaining business operations in India and will continue its development and is currently working with local partners to conduct business in the market. It's kind of weird to see two different parts of the company contradicting each other, but I guess these are weird times. So now let's move on to Vivo. India's enforcement directorate apparently told the Delhi High Court that quote, Vivo India in indulged in money laundering to destabilize the financial system and challenge the integrity and sovereignty of the country. That is a very serious allegation that implies that Vivo, when it allegedly illegally transferred money back home, wasn't just doing this for their own profit, but tried to actively hurt the Indian system. Damn, that sounds like the Indian government isn't just here to slap a couple of wrists, they want blood and they want to put a serious dent into some of these companies. Okay, and my second story of the week is going to be Nokia and OnePlus giving up on basically the last things that made them unique. So Nokia Mobile said that future Nokia phones will no longer have Zeiss optics, with the partnership having ended for good, and my guess is that this is likely because of them giving up on high-end consumer devices and moving more and more towards mid-range phones for maybe even businesses, which isn't exactly a market for high-end cameras. HMD Global previously claimed to use specialty lenses from Zeiss and apparently had a partnership spanning the entire ecosystem, from software and services through to screen quality and the optic design for Nokia branded phones, but now the Nokia XR20 is going to be the last phone from the company with Zeiss lenses, and the lens maker has kind of moved on to partner with Vivo and Sony instead. I'm not mad, I guess the new direction of Nokia kind of doesn't need Zeiss anymore, so I think it makes sense, but it is still sad. But the OnePlus story, on the other hand, is a real head scratcher. So this week in an interview with The Verge, OnePlus admitted that the reason that the new OnePlus 10T won't have an alert slider is because it would make the phone thicker. <sighs> OnePlus chief designer Hope Liu took the ungrateful task of explaining the situation, saying that the alert slider had to go so that the 10T would have enough internal space for other components needed for high wattage charging, a large battery capacity, and better antenna signal. The official explanation is that the alert slider apparently takes up to 30 square millimeters of space in the device, which isn't exactly small and requires a stacked motherboard, which then adds thickness. I guess that's true, but then again, the phone could also just be a hair thicker if that was a feature that people actually cared about. I mean, I don't, so it's not a big deal for me, but it's just a little bit sad that OnePlus is losing even the last thing that kind of made them unique. Next up, this week was also earnings weeks, and I'll do a quick roundup of the biggest news in the tech space, which was kind of a mixed to negative space. Facebook saw its first ever drop in revenue, and while the drop is pretty small for now, it follows their first ever drop in active users from a few months ago, as well as general troubles for the company. Their metaverse push continues to be a really slow and unprofitable grind, and their advertising business seems to be slowing as well. Snapchat announced similarly disappointing numbers, TikTok announced layoffs, and Google's parent Alphabet missed earnings expectations too, though their business still grew at pretty healthy rates. So overall, the online advertising business model seems to become a little bit more difficult as advertisers are pulling back on their spending during these economic uncertainties and the privacy changes on iOS especially made making money harder as well. But uh, now let's move on to chips, which also had kind of mixed results. Intel had yet another terrible quarter with declining revenues and no profits, citing both general consumer decline and their own poor execution. But their foundry recently managed to win MediaTek as a major client going forward. That's right, we could soon see MediaTek chips made by Intel. That is pretty insane. But while we are at manufacturing, Taiwanese chip-making giant TSMC actually had a fantastic quarter. Their mobile phone business basically stopped growing as phone sales in general are slowing down, but they managed to more than make up for that with all of their other segments that all grew very fast. And finally, Microsoft, Samsung, and Apple all had pretty mixed quarters, with some of their businesses down and others up due to them being pretty diversified. Now I bet that many employees in these companies are now super busy planning for the future and if they are, I'm also sure that many of them are already doing that in ClickUp, which you should do too. 
ClickUp is the ultimate productivity tool that combines all the functionality of your existing apps into one powerful platform, and it's the tool that we use internally to build Nebula, our own streaming platform as well. You can create boards to manage tasks and projects with many stages, there is a calendar view to keep you up to date with your deadlines, there are whiteboards where you can brainstorm and ideate, you can create docs and spreadsheets and all of your usual document types and more, and everything is interactive so it can be common commented and assigned to other team members. It's really powerful. Whether you're an individual working on maybe a student project or a startup developing a new app or an employee in a big company with complex workflows, ClickUp is flexible enough to help you manage your entire workflow instead of trying to hammer together multiple tools all the time. And you can check it out using my link in the description where you can sign up for free for a basic plan or get the best prices available on their high tier plans. So check them out and I'll see you in the next video video.